Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session. We are going to be talking about something that I know many of you will have experienced. It's uh, called microaggression, the, the sort of, huh, what did you say or what did you do that we've all experienced at work? Um, so I'm Anne Frank. I'm your moderator. I'm the chief executive of the Chartered Management Institute. And joining me on this session are three wonderful panelists. I'm going to ask them each when I call them by name to introduce themselves very briefly. I will start with Lou Smith. Thanks, Anne, and thank you for inviting me. So I'm Lou Smith. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Lloyds of London. I've been enrolled since about February, so I spent most of that at home. And I also work for the UK government as one of their fintech envoys, so I spend a lot of time in startup land. Brilliant, thank you. And Mohibi, if we could go to you. Sure, my name is Mohibi Hussain, and I'm working for the University of Cambridge as their security and strategy architect. I've been in the IT, IT industry for the last 19 years in several senior executive roles. Great, thank you. And Angela? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Angela Chikanovic and I'm an assistant manager at KPMG working within information risk management and I've been at the firm for five years. Wonderful, thank you all. So microaggressions, what do we mean by that? Well, they can take many forms. It could be as simple as somebody talking over you at a meeting. It could be somebody um, missing your idea and then two seconds later, uh, um, uh, maybe a male colleague says it and uh, everybody jumps on it saying, great idea, Joe. It could be um, that somebody is you know, saying, well, sorry that you don't drink, but we make our decisions in the pub round here. Um, so your problem, not ours. That could be a microaggression. Or it could be, you know, gee, can I touch your hair? Um, so it takes many forms. What we know is that many women, we did some, CMI did some research on this, and we found that four out of five women do experience these in the workplace. And indeed, um, very recently, we did some research that said one in three ethnic um, minority colleagues have also experienced this. It's very, very widespread for underrepresented groups. So microaggressions, I'm gonna ask each of you, have you experienced these or seen colleagues? And could you give us an example? Maybe I'll start with you, Mahibi. Um, yeah, sure. So I think I've experienced in the 19 years that I've spent in the IT industry, I think I've experienced all sorts of microaggressive comments made directly to myself as well as to other fellow female colleagues. Um, ranging from like when I asked for a well-justified well justified raise, I was told that why don't you ask your husband to earn more? And um, you know, th there have been many occasions where during meetings you, you just feel like um, uh, you are not given the same uh, right to speak up or present an idea or say something. So I think there have been subtle, um, subtle, um, ways of communicating this, if you say it aggression, it, it, is, it has been aggressive in some cases where it has been very direct. And for example, I think I shared with you during the rehearsal that once there was an employee function and um, uh, I was actually hosting the function, but a colleague of mine, when I asked him if your wife is going to join us tonight, he said that, do you think this is a place appropriate for women? It was like, it was somebody I was really at good terms with. And uh, I thought, I believe that this colleague respected me. And, but there have been similar comments. And there was one occasion where, where an HR person was um, uh, literally reprimanding a fellow colleague, uh, a female colleague who had just recently joined the organization and objecting on the way she dressed up. And I, I, I told her, I kind of supported and I, I said, if, if it's not in the policy, there's nothing in the policy uh, prohibiting you from wearing the kind of clothes that you are wearing, then you should just stand your ground. So yeah, right. I've, I've seen a, a lot of examples and experienced of it myself. Certainly have. And some of those examples are pretty incredible. What about you, Lou? What, what, what have you seen? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because I think it's more the subtle ones that impact you the most because they become implied. So I'm an openly gay leader in FS and have been in two big retail banks, big organisations. Um, and I think for me, the I think it's, it's more around rather than, I mean, I've heard some of the ones that Mahibi have 
as mentioned, but I think it's those ones where people actually do the ones around the pub one, the one you gave Anne around, well, if you don't drink, are you then not part of something? Or are you part of certain points, but not others? Some really close colleagues of mine don't drink and therefore they can feel like we've got diverse representation, but they're not included because they don't have a voice. So diversity without a voice is pretty pointless actually. Um, so I think for me, it's around, I've heard a number of things around the way I dress, the way that I look, because I probably don't fit certain moulds and I don't fit into some of these categories around head. I've been chased out of toilets, trust me, because they think I'm a boy. Um, so that's, that's, that's been happened to me several times in turn recently. Um, and I think it's, we seem to categorise certain things and I, and I, I think that's dangerous. Uh, and then we think it's acceptable to make comments, but I've heard some of the similar ones to Mahubi. Absolutely. And Angela, what has been your experience? Yes, yeah, so as I said, I've only been at KPMG for five years and I haven't necessarily experienced it myself, although after our rehearsal, I did sort of have a think. And I think um, things that I've heard from, I guess, within the firm or other people have come to me and said that they've experienced is around perhaps, oh, once you go on maternity leave, it's harder to get promoted or you, you won't be able to cope with that. There's perhaps fewer working hours. Then also just entering a room um, where we speak with clients and then people just assuming, even just by the way they look at the male um, person in the room thinking they are maybe the lead on this um, assignment, but in fact it is you. So as um, Lou said, it's very subtle sometimes and it's also about sort of, have they crossed that banter line as well? Some people think, oh, it's just, I'm just being funny, whereas to another person, it has really affected them. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of these things are indeed very subtle, which, of course, um, and they may not be intentional, right? So the obvious question here for each of you and for our audience is, so how do you respond? Do you call it out? Um, what do you think, Mahibi? Do you call it out? What's um, your view? So I think when I started my career, I really wanted to, you know, make my mark and be known as a competitor because I was mostly the only girl in the whole IT team. So I just wanted to do things because I was basically a networking engineer. So I was proving myself by just plugging in cables into routers and switches and doing everything that a man would be able to do just to prove that girls can be engineers and good ones. And because I was always the top of my class. But I think now looking back after 19 years, I think I should have probably called a few of them out. And I think as you previously mentioned, I think there's usually a way to doing that. But having said that, I think it is tricky because you don't want to offend people. You want to build the professional relationships. You want to actually be able to just fit in. So I think it's very difficult and it's it's usually not easy, but I would just like to make one comment. I think because you've labeled it as a microaggression, I think there are certain things which are just, there should be a line drawn. And there are certain words, for example, which are completely non-professional and which are inappropriate. But I think more and more people just kind of, you know, especially during their uh, jokes and, you know, talking among guys, they usually make jokes or use words which could be offensive. So I think there should be a professional language and certain words just should not never be used. So yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, locker room banter. We've heard yes. a lot of examples of that. But um, so Lou, what do you think? Uh, how should you respond? Should you call it out? I, I absolutely think you should do. So I think you have to create a very clear of what you will walk past and what you won't, whether it's directed at you or somebody else. And I think there's a way to do that. I mean, obviously, as Mahibi said, there's certain, there's certain very obvious things you just wouldn't accept. And that, that dictates one response. I think the other thing is, is around helping people understand. I still believe a lot of the subtle elements are people who, who misunderstand things. And therefore, I think it's a conversation to help them understand of points of acceptability. But I, I think if my colleagues were here and also my friends is I'm known for not walking past that because I think it can be really damaging long term to about how you impact somebody's 
confidence. And we talk about in the workplace around bringing your full self, because when you bring your full self, you're the most effective. People will follow you. People will engage with you. If you're fearful, then you're never going to be yourself. So I think it took, it's really taken me a while. But I think for me, you have to have the conversation. There's a way to do that and deal with fact rather than deal with noise. So for me, I try to always have that conversation. Great. Yeah, some great advice there. And Angela, what are your thoughts on uh, calling it out and responding? Yeah, I think it's definitely a difficult one, especially if you have um, perhaps more senior people and then it's all about you wanting to drive your career forward and you think, gosh, will this be damaging for my own career? Um, but I think when something is inappropriate and it makes you feel uncomfortable, then it should definitely be called out and we should maybe... I guess you asked the question sort of how to do that and maybe putting it back onto them, um, asking them a question, just saying, sorry, what do you mean by that? Or, um, you know, that makes me feel in a certain way, letting them also reflect on what they've said. So not coming at them aggressively yourself, but just sort of letting them know how you feel about the comment that they've just made. There's some great strategies there, and we're going to come on to talk about those strategies. And you just mentioned a few there, Angela, very important. How it made you feel. Nobody can take that away from you, right? Or asking for clarification. What did you mean by that? Uh, there are strategies. You're all saying call it out. That is, I agree with you. There's research that says if we want to change things, we have to raise awareness of these things. That's how you change culture. That's how you change behavior. So Lou, what are other tips you have for, um, you know, how you call it out, how you deal with this? So I think in terms of, I mean, I, I've been in this industry now over 20 years. And for me, it took me a while to, to do that because I think you do, to Angela's point, you do, worry what the impact that will have on your career but actually there's something more important which is your own values and also I kind of felt like and particularly when I first came out which was a long long time ago now and actually it still shocks me that there was still it was still you know in some places illegal and still is today but also it was it was like that here and I think for me it was unless I adopt an approach or unless I behave in a certain way then what what am I setting for somebody who comes after me and you know I'd be lying if I didn't say that I was scared to death because I was um, and I've always been open about that and and I hope now and I tried to fit in I did the whole you know suits and skirts and everything else and I felt so uncomfortable um, so for me I think it's about I got to get comfortable with myself and then I actually decided that this was how I was going to be and then if something crosses a boundary then I call that out and I always have that conversation but I'd like to do it I'd like to say that I try to do it in a kind way as well because I still think and I still genuinely believe most of the time it's miscommunication misunderstood or misunderstandings and then you can go from there because they don't know how you feel about certain things and I think that's that's why for me, I tried to book it into those three things because I genuinely believe there is a very small percentage where it's a bad intent. Absolutely, and Mahibi, you gave us some great examples and earlier in your career, like your colleagues on the panel, you were concerned about raising it, but you've said now you would. And um, how, how do you think that should be done? How, how would you do that going forward? Um, so I think HR should be playing a more important role in defining what's permissible in a workplace and what's not, so that there is at least something which is written in ink that you could refer to. But having said that, these are subtle things because you do want to build a rapport or a relationship with your colleagues and you do want to move up in your career and you do want to you know, shine as a team player as well. So I think maybe a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the colleague who made that kind of comment and you know that you just can't cut ties with them because you do have to engage with them in, in the future. So maybe just talking to them in private because uh, that is a general rule that if you, if you, you know, call out someone or if you just, um, you know, confront them in, in front of others, they may get too defensive. 
But uh, but there, having said that, I think there are certain things that should be just forbidden, like foul language or, you know, as you said, the 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 banter that maybe makes un some people uncomfortable, but it's it's just kind of a joke for others. So there should be some things which are just considered unprofessional in any environment. And I think HR sh should be the one taking the lead to kind of making that not permissible in a workplace. But, and for example, in most of the organizations that I've worked uh, in, and I've had the privilege to work with really good ones, they have developed over time. They have uh, trainings in, diversity and showing respect in the workplace. So I think maybe the material needs to be updated and also people need to be made aware of what could make somebody uncomfortable. But then if I have a, a personal, like a professional relationship with somebody, I would probably talk to them in, in private. And then the senior management, they should be more aware of this sort of thing. And they should be educated on how to, if, if a girl comes to them and, you know, reports something which is not appropriate, then they should be equipped themselves on how to handle that uh, thing, that complaint or that, you know, uh, incident mm -hmm. response in this kind of a situation is something that managers, line managers, directors, and people who have probably, who are not aware of this themselves, they should be made aware of. Completely. There's a lot in there. So you mentioned the role of, of senior management. So really the CEO and the, has to create a zero tolerance kind of environment where he says or she says, I want this called out. Please bring it to my attention. And I know many CEOs who have done that and changed their cultures. Um, and actually, um, Angela, uh, before we go to questions, you mentioned uh, especially if you are in a power relationship, that person might be a senior manager or a line manager. You mentioned the use of champions. Uh, maybe you can touch on that. Yeah, so just um, like recently it's formed um, at KPMG. We have a women's forum and it's just a safe space where females can raise any issues um, that they've experienced. And then we discuss as a group on how to act or people can give their advice and input. Um, I guess the only thing with that, I would just say you have to be wary that it doesn't become, you know, a moaning session um, because, yeah, nobody wants that. But so we have sort of key um, outcomes that we sort of list out and say, right, this is what we want to get out of the session and how to make it, I guess, work. Um, but I found, and I know others within our company and especially new um, people coming into our company have found that quite useful just to have that space where they can sort of openly discuss and question, um, question certain situations. Yeah, that's uh, some, some great points there. Now, I think um, we may have lost or is she still here? I hope she's still here. But we've got a lot of questions. So I want to come to those questions. Um, so the first question I'm going to go to is from Vesa Kalani. She says, an issue I have experienced frequently is when I build up the courage to confront these people with their microaggressions and inappropriate comments, I'm often met with a response of, I would never. The men around me seem to be convinced that it's impossible for them to be misogynistic or homophobic because they know discrimination is bad. Is this the experience shared among the panel? Well, um, uh, let's, let's deal with that. Uh, so Mahibi, what do you say to that? Um, so I think from what I've seen over the years, I think the policies, as I mentioned before, I think they need to maybe uh, evolve a bit because I've seen like there are very uh, stringent policies, like there's a policy of sexual harassment or discrimination, but I haven't seen policies where they deal with the, you know, more subtle things like maybe um, some language which could be offensive or some kind of um, an attitude that is that has been prevalent during meetings, for example, not letting uh, the, the women uh, members of the team speak up that often or, you know, subtle things. So I think we, we do need to change our HR policies as well. Like there, there are really strict and tough policies for uh, discrimination or some sort of harassment or, you know, but there are certain things which are just beyond or they don't fall into that uh, hard criteria. So I think the HR policies need to evolve as well and people need to get educated about what's offensive and what not. Because a lot of times it's, there are obviously the sexual harassment um, uh, domain, that's a serious issue, but at times it's, it's just all or nothing. So either you make a complaint 
which is labeled sexual harassment or uh, discrimination or nothing. So I think it's it's important to just um, you know highlight the the issue that there are subtle attitudes or subtle uh, words or statements or behavior that can be um, you know offensive. Uh, and that is borderline, you know, discrimination or disrespectfulness uh, for to, to, towards somebody. Yeah, and and you know, I would add uh, to the to this questioner um, uh, that it, it, if you focus on how does it make you feel, you know, rather than it's it, you know, you may not be aware, but the this is how it made this person feel, or did you see Jane's face when you made that remark? And this is also where the willingness to change culture from the top becomes so very important. And it looks like we may have lost Lou. She must be having connectivity issues. But I know that Lloyd's of London did a very big study on this and they found, boy, does their culture need changing. And, and so, you know, it's the chair and the CEO that say, wow, we found out that huge numbers of women feel uncomfortable and they feel harassed and we have got to change that culture. So it's getting that, that from the top that's very important. Um, there's a question here from Camilla Costa. How do you educate male colleagues without lecturing them and being seen as the quote unquote bitchy one? Well, Angela, what do you do there? Yeah, that's um, a tricky one. But I guess if you have a sort of good relationship with them, then having a private conversation, as Mahivi said, they should understand and as you said Anne if you're talking to them about your feelings and opening up they should feel almost yeah honoured that you feel comfortable enough to do this if it's somebody that you might not have that good of a connection with maybe then raising it to somebody who you trust and that you can have a conversation the three of you to explain the situation in private I would say I don't think it needs to now be sort of spread openly because it can be sorted in probably quite a quick conversation. Um, often enough, it is just explaining how you feel and sometimes also reflecting on yourself. So how does it make me feel? But am I really offended by it? Or um, do I have something, am I thinking perhaps too deeply into it? Because some things they can, I guess, be left aside. But if you do feel Sort of very uncomfortable in that situation definitely have that conversation with them um, in private or bring in somebody you trust absolutely and having those allies or champions yeah. that are sort of at, not in your line they can play that very important role of creating that safe space for you to have the conversation and don't forget you're trying to educate the mm. um, person it's like i'm sure you're not intentionally yeah sexist or racist or um, you know, homophobic, you know, the impact of your remark, this is how it made me feel. And perhaps you sh should consider what did you really mean by that, right? So it's exposing as, as Lou was talking about some of those miscommunications. Um, uh, I have um, a comment about yeah. that. I think awareness courses, for example, if if you violate your speed uh, on, the, on the roads, you have speed awareness courses. I think some sort of awareness courses can be very helpful where, where they focus on the subtleties and the sensitivities of, you know, what should be uh, appropriate in a workplace and what not be. And we do need to design such awareness campaigns or courses, I believe. Absolutely. And I should um, mention that CMI does a bite-sized course on precisely this thing. So, you know, a bite-sized quick course on uh, diversity and inclusion. So I completely agree with that point. Um, but there is a question here also about language from Marlene Spensley. She asks, I work in a very male dominated environment. Well, let's face it, tech is still male dominated um, where inappropriate language and swearing is often celebrated by the all male management as passion and energy. How can you call it out when there are no female leaders and you are out being ridiculed or labeled square or a troublemaker? Wow, do you have a tough situation, Marlene? And unfortunately, you are not alone. There are many situations still where the culture is as you describe. So Mahibi, I know I'm gonna come to both of you on this, but you work in this kind of culture. What's your advice for Marlene? Um, so I think that you would need to find 
some advocate somewhere, whether it's in senior management, somebody who can sympathize with your situation. Ideally, it should be HR that should be listening to this kind of complaint. For example, the, the lady mentioned, I don't know, whoever uh, asked this question, they mentioned that the, it's the male dominated environment and they consider it passion. So I think the definition needs to be changed or oh, definitely it was a lady. So it, the definition needs to be changed of passion and energy. And I think it has to come from the top management. And if the top management, they can't sympathize with the lady in a one-on-one -on -one conversation where she can politely present her case, then definitely it has to be either HR or somebody higher up than the immediate line manager. Well, indeed, and the famous example of Susan, the engineer at, um, um, at Uber, right? That called out that, that culture there, quite similar to the one that Marlene is describing. Um, and ultimately it cost the CEO his job once that went, one, once that got out. And, you know, I do think that it is, is, you especially Marlene need to be brave here and look for allies as Mahibi has said. Um, and, and, and if nobody's listening, then consider, you know, um, taking it further as Susan did. Um, but Angela, what, are you, what advice are you going to give Marlene? Yeah, very similar. So again, going back to their allies, um, they don't even have to be in your team, but maybe then having somebody from another team saying, look, this is the situation here, or this is how we've overcome this. And in, I know it sounds quite extreme, but in the worst circumstance, if you really are unhappy in this culture and it isn't for you, you can you can move, um, you can look for other opportunities where I'm sure you will excel, perhaps even within the company in a different department, because the worst is then if you're unhappy on a daily basis and this is causing you sort of a lot of problems. Yeah, absolutely. And you can always vote with your feet. And if that doesn't yeah. improve, I, I really think you should, Marlene, and also consider whistleblowing. Um, remember, employees have more power on this sort of thing these days, which is great. So question from Hannah Bath. Um, early on in this session, the topic of what women wear to work has come up as an issue. In my experience, I've had some microaggressions thrown at me, mostly by women, in regards to what I may wear. How would you approach this topic in the workplace? Um, well, obviously, Lou talked about that, and Mohibi, you did as well. Um, so, um, you know, how did you approach the issue and this, in this case, of what, what other women are saying about uh, what what Hannah's wearing. So I refer to the HR policy for, for my colleague because I said if it's not prohibited in the HR policy and there's an appropriate dress code that you are following, then nobody has a right to you know, judge you based on their personal preferences on how you should dress up. It's actually offensive because they should not be you know, just targeting you just because of that. So I would say, look at the HR policy and if there's, you can't find one, then reach out to whoever manages the HR policies. And uh, then again, if it's, um, if it's just coming from colleagues who are just probably attacking you out of jealousy or some other personal uh, despise, then maybe, maybe just you know, talk to them one-on-one -on -one because obviously you can't win all the battles. And maybe sometimes there are people who are not going to agree with you or like you and you just have to live with them. Uh, that in some cases, I guess. Yeah, great point. Um, we still have time for another question. This is a good one from Emma Sheriff, who says, I'm in the first few years of my career as a software developer um, after having a software, completing a software engineering degree. And I'm often seen as the baby um, of the team that doesn't have a lot of technical knowledge. I'm the only developer, technical person in the small team I work in. Does the panel have any advice on how I overcome this? I feel it's holding me back and progressing so I'm going to turn to Angela, and I also have a piece of advice for Emma, and I'm sure Mohibi will as well, and then uh, we'll probably be at the end of the session. But go on, Angela. What's yes. So I didn't come from a technical background, um, studied something completely different to technology, but knew it's an exciting topic, um, knew I wanted to work with clients and people and mix the two together. Um, so, but this hasn't held me back. The first thing that I was told was everybody starts at the same level when they come in to the firm um, in this job role. It might be a bit different for you. But what I would say is get involved in other initiatives. You don't just have to get involved in tech initiatives. Get involved in, in things like this. We, I mean, 
we reached out to people to get involved in this panel event. We are then approached by other people and it's such an exciting way to make your career that little bit different. And then you can put that forward on the table in your reviews and say, look, okay, I've done my work, my base job, but also I've adapted and I've, um, I guess, multitasked and I, I've spoken at a panel event or I've coached, I've coached someone um, junior or been a reverse mentor even. So find those other opportunities that you enjoy that aren't always related like so closely with engineering or with technology and then um, show that you can do that side of things as well. That's great advice. And also find a sponsor that can yeah. help you. And finally, keep an achievement log so that when you do have your reviews, you have a record of all of those great achievements and and uh, you, you can speak out about them. Well, I'm afraid we have run out of time. Um, I think I'm getting the message um, that we are done. So thank you all for your questions. Thank you to my fellow panelists for their great remarks and, uh, and uh, have a wonderful um, event. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.